It's time for To The Last Drop Podcast with Liam Delcom and Brendan Nell. We're back. It's episode eight of To The Last Drop. Uh, Brendan Nell here and Liam Delcom with me. And uh, a big week for the box. Their the friendliest, friendliest game against the All Blacks coming up. And the surprise in the centre. Um, interesting choice of team there. It is. Uh, they told us weeks ago that they would edge towards what is the uh, best 23. Uh, and what we've seen now is that they are edging close to that 23, but they still throw in one or two little curveballs. Um, and in, I suppose also a little bit uh, understandable in that a guy like Caden Moody, Moody who's done so well on the right wing, he's grabbed, he's, he sees these opportunities. But just to have a look at him in a different position, uh, there has been a lot of talk of him play, potentially playing 13, and now he's been given that responsibility in a very, very big test. When I say very, very big test, test it is the All Blacks. There's nothing much riding on it apart from it being a, a test against the All Blacks. But still a, a, a big challenge, no doubt, uh, and, and a very interesting selection, as you as you noted. Yeah, and uh, look, I know the Bulls have been talking about playing him at 13 for quite a while now, so obviously that's also got through to the box. And I, But I sort of wondered to myself this week when they made the selection that would they have done this if he hadn't had two Man of the Match performances in a row? And uh, you know, maybe that sort of tip, tipped the selection a bit that they felt, well, he's in such good form, you know, now is the chance to try it rather than you know, do it later on. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you have to weigh up uh, keeping the winning team and, and sort of keeping momentum and still weighing it up against, still making a couple of changes and just having a look at a play in a different position and see him in a, in a different light and how he, resp- how he responds in a different position. Um, and I think it's, it's it's brave, there's no doubt, but what Kanan Moody has shown so far is that he can rise to the challenge. So I think there'll be a lot of eyes on him, especially if uh, the All Blacks come up with uh, B- Rico Iwani in the opposite jersey. Yeah. Oh, well, Rico is the one guy who also made his debut at 19 and uh, yep. you know has grown into that role as well. And, and uh, there's a lot of doubts of him in New Zealand, as there tends to be when a new player comes in. Uh, yeah, somewhat unwarranted at times. But, uh, yeah, he's grown into that. And Kanan's definitely shown um, yeah, enough maturity to, to warrant that sort of uh, yeah, confidence in him. Uh, it's interesting, though, but what I found quite interesting, I mean, we, we could probably have expected at some point in this sort of lead-up to the World Cup for them to do that. But uh, pairing him with Andre Estesen is an interesting one, um, especially because, yeah, they're both quite... I mean, Kanan's not the, the bulkiest guy, but he's tall. So it's an interesting centre combination. It is. It it also smacks a bit of uh, the, you've got a sort of a, a, a combination there that feeds into what the box did so well at the last World Cup, and it's the way they swarm, uh, you know, the opposing attack. Uh, Kane and Moody does make fantastic reads, defensive reads, and because he's gangly and he's got like these octopus arms and legs, he he, he kind of gets in the way and he makes a proper nuisance of himself. Um, and as I said, he, he reads the game very well. So. Uh, yeah, it, it 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 is an interesting combo. There's no doubt, uh, but I think it's one that can work. I mean, it's one that can certainly uh, at least try and suffocate what New Zealand have to offer in midfield. Yeah, and I think we're probably looking at as well, which they won't say. But I mean, if if Estesen puts in a couple of big hits, they're hoping maybe a spilt ball there and Kanan picks it up, or you know, mm. sort of pressurizes the defender, and that sort of makes a mistake, and and obviously he gets there, and then obviously with a guy like Kurti. On the outside, um, yeah, you can cause some damage. Uh, but I think the big thing for the box, though, is um, they're going to have to start a bit better. Yes, that's been a, a topic of discussion. I just want to touch on one other thing about Moody. Uh, it's interesting that he has now to play uh, outside centre in this game because if you go a horses for courses approach, you could have put some money on him starting on the right wing against Scotland, uh, given the fact uh, that a guy like Duan van der will probably occupy the, the 11 jersey on the other side uh, in terms of an aerial battle. But, I mean, I'm not suggesting for one moment that uh, Cheslin Colby is not up to that challenge. Um, I'm just making the point that a guy like Kanan Moody uh, does offer you the, the tall timber. Well, I mean, Cheslin did basically basically cover him on, in the Lions tour as well. So, and, and, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't think there's any any worry about Cheslin's sort of abilities. Uh, I, just, I think the, what the box have sort of done is, is obviously – 
Kanan Kanan's on in superb form at the moment, and 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 he's, he's really grabbing. grabbing yeah, he's very much the man um, with with momentum. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So playing him again is probably not the worst thing. Let 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 if the guy's in form, um, let him play. I mean, I suppose uh, most coaches worth their salt will will tell you that. Yeah, no, no. Uh, just looking at the other selections, I think uh, interesting the back three, the same back three that was at Twickenham last time they played. Uh, with Kurt Lee and 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 Marcus Ole and and Damien Willemser, um, so yeah, I suppose they're looking a bit of that same sort of tweaking the magic where Kurt Lee sort of scorched England last year, last year, and hopefully get this get the same sort of uh, yeah space and, and and sort of sidestep again on on attack. Mm. Uh, you you kind of reminding me of now that that old saying about you being as, as only as good as your last game, um, and obviously they were outstanding in that one. But going into this game, they probably all three of them have a point to prove uh, because of what the the trio did, you know, last week. The, the other yeah. guys who vacated those jerseys, so um, yeah, they, they can't they can't uh, slip up in this one. They want to probably keep up the pressure and. Uh, maintain the coach's interest in them, you know, as potential starters against Scotland. So, but but it's a fantastic trio. I mean, if they if they get going and play properly off each other, uh, the All Blacks could have their hands full. Yeah, and um, just I mean, looking at that Welsh game, I, I don't know how much we take really out of that other than confidence and momentum. Um, yeah, that yeah. yeah, I don't think Wales put up much of a fight. I don't think we have to talk too much about that game. But uh, yeah, it was nice to see the Bok engine running. You know, sort of in third gear, fourth gear, but uh, but not much of a not much. I suppose other than confidence, not much more than that. It, it was a poor Wales team, let's be honest. Uh, but you can only play what's in front of you, and I thought the box did that. They did that well. I mean, they they didn't start that well, but they found the gears that they needed to late in the game, and they looked good. Um, but I wouldn't read too much into that performance, apart from yeah, as you say, a confidence mm. booster. The uh, the other the rest of the selections against Wales. I mean, I look at the guy, the guy like Dwayne Vermeulen coming in. Uh, you know, said we spoke a little bit about that. I mean, Jasper Visser uh, almost feels like he's he's sort of fallen a bit off the radar. He, in a game like the game against Wales, he didn't exactly sort of come to the fore. And and, and we we all know we, what he can be like when he's he's devastating. And it just feels like he's a bit off the mark there. And Dwayne's definitely the guy who can easily take take the tra- opportunity like he has all season and uh, sort of yeah. almost force his way back into that starting lineup against Scotland. Yeah, the the the, the sort of the word in the, the camp earlier this year was that, you know, a guy like Visa obviously has been uh, groomed to take over from Dwayne, um, you know, on a more permanent basis. Uh, and that has certainly been the case the last year or so. But I agree with you, yeah, Jasper didn't necessarily seize the moment uh, against the Wales, and he didn't really seize the moment against the All Blacks when he got to start there either. So, and if you then look at Dwayne's performances, I think he's been outstanding uh, in mm. the opportunities he's got. So, you know, they may have a rethink um, where the idea might have been initially to have a visa start and then Dwayne come off the bench uh, in the second half. Uh, th- that may warrant a rethink. I wouldn't necessarily abandon that plan just yet because I think Dwayne has it brings immense value in the second half when more experienced and cool and calm heads um, are needed to close out tight, tense matches. And I'd, I'd rather have him on the field then. Yeah. My last point about this squad selection, probably just interesting to see another guy who can take his opportunity, Franco Mostert, Sos. And, and and more than that, just the fact that the box have gone on the bomb squad bench with um, Jean Klein and Erkis Neyman. So it almost feels like they're playing them a bit as a combo more than individuals in the, vying for position. And and we probably see that a bit more at the World Cup. But yeah, uh, great opportunity for Franco Mostert. That number five jersey hasn't been locked down yet. And uh, we could see uh, a bit of Sos going, going, going for it there. Uh, absolutely. Uh, what we probably need to remember is that he was the regular number five for a while. In fact, started the last World Cup as the sort of incumbent number five. They played the All Blacks, lost that game. And then Louis de Jager had uh, one or two fantastic games. And uh, Franco most of the after that became part of the bomb squad. And I think he played after that tournament, the four games, the first four games against the All Blacks, all of them uh, he came um, off the bench. Um, and has yeah. sort of uh, established himself as a key, uh, integral member of the bomb squad. So it's interesting that he uh, earns a start in this one. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mostert because I think he's a very wholehearted player. 
uh, he empties the tank properly. You never get the impression that um, uh, his work yeah. rate isn't where it's supposed to be. So you get good, honest endeavor from him. So I'm, I'm glad he gets a start to see, you know, what he can do from uh, from kickoff. Um, and I think you're right. I think the the, the virtues of a, of a regular partnership, as we've seen with Jean Klein and um, Erkis Neumann, is is, uh, is something obviously the box have, have invested in now. It's something that they probably want to use uh, going forward. Just on the makeup of that bomb squad, um, there it's just it's a strange one. I mean, the front row is the front row, and yeah, you know, either one of those front rows can easily slot in into the starting role. That's not a problem. But uh, this time around, they've gone for the two locks on the bench. Only one loose for it, and obviously that's because they've got versatility on the field as well. Um, but yeah, yeah Marco van Staden is, is it's an interesting bench combination. Uh, it's not one we've seen before, and also a bit of experimentation there to see how it works, the impact they bring in that second half. Yeah, I, th- I suppose Erge does give you the option if you um, if you need him to play flank, he, he probably could do that. Uh, you could have a situation where uh, a guy like not necessarily that you want to do it, but you could uh, play most of there in the second half and get one of the other locks on. So there are options. But, and there is, you're right, there is lots of versatility. So I think that is one thing. Versatility is actually a word that Rasi Rasmus used quite often, I remember, in some of the briefings earlier this year, because it's something he feels that um, a World Cup squad absolutely needs, because things never go 100% according to script, and you need to be able to roll with the punches and make uh, make decisions sort of uh, on the hoof, and I, I think versatility gives you that option. No, definitely. Uh, and then, of course, the elephant in the room, yeah. Um, a certain goal kicker. <laughs> the one everyone's talking about, the one everyone's carrying uh, on look, about. Look, I mean, yeah, <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, I, I think uh, if we're going to go cliches, I'm going to say Stormer in a teacup. <laughs> um, I think Mani Lebok is a fine goal kicker. I think he's, he's one of the country's best. He happens to be going through a dip now. Uh, most goal kickers, as we all know, go through a bit of a dip and then ultimately they they, they come out of it. Um, he's going through one now, but if you were to judge Mani Lebok uh, over the last two seasons, it, it, take into account URC last season, URC this season, uh, even the bulk of his Bok tests, um, the man can kick, there's no doubt about that. And he's just going through a bit of a, a iffy yeah. patch. Um, I, I think uh, some of the angst uh, is probably also uh, generated by the fact that um, there's no sort of clear uh, backup. So in other words, if he fails, then everybody goes like, okay, who's next kind of thing. So there is that pressure on him. But as I said, I mean, I, uh, I, I, I have absolute faith in his ability to kick a goal. And I think he brings a lot uh, to the to the Bok team in terms of attack. Uh, yeah. I think we've we've seen them grow an armed leg in that department uh, well, I, since I, the end of the last year. Yeah, and I, I think I mean if you just have to look at the game against Wales, just two moments that uh, there was the one try for Kanan Moody where he he stopped his his pass went past the defender. I think it was Johnny Williams, and then sent the ball out there. Just the just the the way he did that, and then. The, the other one was his long pass to Damien Willemse, who ran a beautiful angle to beat the defence and score a try there. Uh, yeah, those th- those aren't things we've seen from Springbok Flowers a lot in the last 20 years. Uh, yeah, those those are the type of moments that we all want to see the Springboks doing, and, yeah. and he, he, he brings out those magic moments. Yeah, he's kicking the last two tests. His kicking has been at 56%. We obviously wanted to be around, around about... Um, yeah, seventy five, eighty percent, like most people. But the box are backing him, and the big question is who else. And I think that's been part of a bit of my irritation is that, you know, we've kept on. We spoke about it before in previous podcasts um, yeah. about the the conspiracy theories and the Andre Pollard thing. And yeah, there was a there was a moment yesterday with with, with um, Jock Ninava answered the question about would Andre be going back to his club after the All Black game, and he he said his short answer. No, he is going back to his club and, and we've given him the squad and nobody else. And then he went on for another minute and a half saying how wonderful Andre had trained. And yeah, I was I sat there and I thought to myself, a short answer is a short answer. And I mean, that's the way Jacques <laughs> speaks. So, I mean, I don't want to criticize yeah. Jacques for that. But by by talking yeah. so much about Andre over the last sort of week or two, they've, they've almost sort of kept that fire going of that conspiracy theory. Yeah. And and yeah. It, it's it's rather unfortunate, uh, and, and because that I think as well has placed extra pressure on Marnie, 
because there's all these people who think, well, when's Pollard coming back? And the truth of the matter is, if there's no injury, he's not going to be back, and Marnie's who you've got. Exactly. Um, and the the fact is, if you look around the rest of the, well, the 33-man squad, uh, he is the recognized goal kicker now. So, you know, but there's, there's no point in... Uh, in moaning about it, Pollard wasn't fit at the time. The you know the the, the call had to be made. The call was made, and he, he wasn't ready yet. Um, and the box now basically have to persevere. They have to back their own system. Uh, yeah. it's, it's no yeah. point um, sort of dwelling on it now. Now, yeah, and the thirty three man squad to just in the jock said yes. They they've sent it through to World Rugby. It's finalized, and that's it. So I mean, there's there's end of discussion on that one. Um, yeah, anyway, I, I saw a news, another a news outlet actually wrote a piece about the the deadline looming and whether Pollard will be in. And I thought um, nothing has happened on that front to suggest that the man suddenly changed his mind. Yeah, I know. I know. It's just it's been a frustrating one because we all get the same questions and we all see the same headlines. And then yeah, it, yeah, you sort of think, but what are they seeing that I'm not seeing? It's uh, anyway, but. That's that's where I'm going to leave that discussion because I get rather frustrated by that, and uh, <laughs> we don't have the time to delve into all of those things. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go in quickly into a clip of Audi Sevier. Um, he was chatting about the Springbok game and Audi being a great competitor, uh, and just uh, saying that no matter how friendly this game is set up to be, in front of eighty thousand people at uh, at Twickenham, uh, there's no ways this is a friendly. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, we've talked about there's no such word as warm-up for us. We, every time we put on that black jersey, every time we run out, we're trying to do the jersey proud and, I guess, you know, do the legacy proud. So um, that's kind of out of our vocabulary at the moment. We want to go out there firing and banging. You know, they're big, they're big men and they're physical and, you know, they'll look. they be looking at that last test around the first 20 and they want to come out firing and nullify us um, and... You know, the way we started with Aussie, you know, if we give that to South Africa, we're going to have a long day at the office. So, um, you know, they pose a massive threat around their physicality, their threats around the breakdown. So we just got to, you know, nail our, our structures, our game plan um, and be ready and staying ready for, for things that they go away. You're with Brendan Nell and Liam Delcom on the To The Last Drop podcast. Uh, to be fair, Brendan, I'm not sure how many people used the word friendly. Uh, didn't they use the word warm up? Because I think the moment somebody uses the word friendly, you're going to get jumped on. Yeah, and no, I think warm up's probably the wrong thing as well, especially if you get the context of what happened in Auckland. <laughs> You'd hope that they'd be a lot, lot warmer by the time they start the game. And uh, yeah, they can't have another. I think that's the big thing for the box. Um, yeah, they they went out. Andre Estes and said in the press conference today, he said, you know, we owe ourselves. We don't owe the All Blacks one. We owe ourselves one because of the way we started in Auckland. And I think that's pretty much the box mindset. It's going to be a hell of a clash. Uh, Eighty thousand people at Twickenham, neutral field. Uh, yeah, it's the team. And and the worst part about it is it means nothing at the end of the day. It it doesn't. The only thing you can. There, there is a trophy at stake, isn't there? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all for the, the for the for the sponsors and all that stuff. But nobody really cares about the trophy. <laughs> uh, if you, uh, that's all, one thing about these things. Even in in, in rugby championship and Tri Nations, the old days, we used to see the Freedom Cup and the Mandela Cup. And other than the first time they played for it, I don't think anybody. Have you ever seen one of those yeah. photos with them with the trophy again? Nobody. They take it for the sponsors. Yeah. Uh, the, the, those trophies are somewhere in a cabinet, and um, yeah, it's it's gathering dust, and yeah, they will disappear in the mists of time. Yeah, I mean, nobody really cares who wins the Freedom Cup or the Mandela Cup or the whatever cup it is. Um, I don't even want, know what this cup is, uh, but that's it's yeah. As long as it makes the sponsors happy and they keep investing in the game, I suppose that's all that really matters there. Um, but yeah, um, it's going to be a massive game, uh, and and yeah, we then we into the final stretch, and then it's. Uh, but may I just add? I mean, I, I was thinking of this game and sort of the 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 meaning of it, and you know, it would be, it's supposed to be this warm up game, and um, people talking about that. Well, why would the All Blacks uh, play the box? Um, you know, ahead of World Cup in the sort of their last game, um, and then I thought back to the to the 1999 third and fourth place playoff uh, at the World Cup, where you know, as those teams walked out and they did the anthems, you also got the sense of like, you know, neither side really wants to be here. Um, and, and the game was 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 equally flat. I mean, there wasn't, uh, look, I mean, I'm not suggesting for one moment 
the players held back, but it just didn't. It just lacked a proper sense of occasion. Mm. Um, so there, there is a bit of yeah, um, yeah. There is that sense that uh, we sort of revisiting old territory. Yeah. Um, moving on to a different note, I was the other night at uh, Monte Cassino for uh, the South African Hall of Fame's function inducting the uh, this 2007 World Cup squad into the Hall of Fame. Uh, it was quite a nice function, I must admit. A lot of the players, a lot of jokes going around about how some of those players still fit into their blazers uh, 16 years on. Um, some of them still look extremely good. Uh, some of them look uh, a, a bit worse for wear. Uh, but it was a, it was a good song. Names, <laughs> names, Brendan. Uh, no, no, I don't think we should go into too many names. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, it's not like we oil paintings ourselves. So, um, yeah, uh, but I, I think I think it was a, it was a good catch up and nice seeing all of those guys again. Um, yeah, I, some of the strangest, some of the guys that I haven't seen for ages, like Wayne Judy's, for instance. There was one that I yeah, didn't see for a yeah. long time, and yeah, it was it was a great function, sir. So. Yeah, I'm sure. It's also funny how you bump into to ex players uh, sort of years after they've stopped playing, and then when they recognise you, uh, you know, the sort of welcome you get is is almost overwhelming. Yeah, and very much so that night as well. And you sort of think back of some of the ways they uh, they were quite hostile to us journos back when they were playing. Um, in always obviously in a good way, always. Uh, well, most of them at least. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and, and, uh, there was a quite a nice. I must have I quite enjoyed Jake White and his speech. Um, so they had a, quite a quite a funny quip. He said, uh, "Yeah, most of the staff are yeah, Kurt Smalls." Yeah, he said. Tutti, of course, Alistair could see us coaching Namibia. So he's on his way to the World Cup. Alistair's going to be like Eddie. He's going to keep on going to World Cups until he wins one. <laughs> Which I thought was quite a good chip from Jake. That's a very good chip, I have to say. Um, and yeah, I, I, spoke, I, got, I caught up with Jake as well. So we're going to play you a clip of, just ask him about, you know, obviously playing in France and, and winning a World Cup in France and what it takes for the box now. And yeah, this is what he said to me. Uh, you know, I think it's probably the one World Cup where uh, where, where underdogs can win certain big games, and that changes the whole complexity of the of the of the of the of the tournament. And that's the interesting thing. I think, to be fair, it is the toughest draw we've ever had. Uh, because we, however we get there, we, we're gonna. It's highly unlikely minnows are gonna knock everyone out before we get to play. In the we're gonna play someone big along the way. You know what I mean? Uh, we have to play Scotland and Ireland. But what I'm saying, over above that, you're gonna play France or New Zealand. And then you're probably going to have to play England, Australia, Argentina, and then you're probably going to have to play one of those other big guns again. Yeah. I can't see that once those big teams get to the end of the tournament, they'll not they'll get knocked out. Yeah. Well, let me say this: the one thing that I, I don't want to mention a name, but let me tell you what I've realised in the World Cup. You get Intermax out, and they're going to play Jelly Bear there. Okay. When we lost John de Villiers and we put in Franz Stein, look what Franz Stein did. I mean, he won a World Cup and he won another World Cup. So, you know, if you if you look at at the, all the teams around the world, there's someone that's going to be remembered for something. And the fact that, you know, example, Louis de Jorge doesn't go, or the fact that Polo doesn't go, or the fact that, uh, you know, Am doesn't go. Who knows? Maybe that's the door that's going to open, you know, for one player who's going to make a massive name for himself. And as you say, you asked me about a Springbok. I'm not sure who it'll be, but I'm, I'm almost sure that this World Cup is going to be someone that no one expects because everyone's talking about that. I mean, who would have expected France Stein to kick a 60-meter penalty in a World Cup final a year before the World Cup? You know, so a lot of things are going to happen, and a lot of and a lot of exciting things. Yeah, that's uh, typical Jake, isn't it? Um, he, he always comes up with a with a bit of a Perler. Um, but it's never it's never a, a, a boring moment when you put a microphone in front of him. And you know what? He makes a good point. Uh, if you think also, I know he mentioned Jean de Villiers there, but if you think back to the 2011 World Cup, where a guy like uh, Stephen Donald was far away and um, came and won them the World Cup. Uh, to be fair, it was only the one kick, but but still, I mean, he won it. So it was, uh, Dan Carter was injured. Well, Colin Slade was injured. Uh, Aaron Cruden was injured. So, yeah. And it's yeah, and, and uh, look, I mean, also I have to say that that game was, uh, I think the French can feel a little hard done by. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Uh, I think I think Craig Hubert, um, who's now works, he lives in New Zealand nowadays, of of, of all things. Uh, wow. Yeah, good good man, Craig. We uh, get along very well. We have lots of debates. Craig. 
But uh, I think that game and in 2015 his game against Scotland were probably two of the games that he probably would least want to remember. Um, but uh, <laughs> that's all water under the bridge now. Talking about uh, easy for you to say. <laughs> I'm not Scottish so, <laughs> or French. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, just uh, talking about teams with problems. Um, yeah, if you'd rather want to be in Rossi's shoes or Jacques' shoes, um, then you'd want to be in Steve Borthwick's shoes at the moment because. Yeah, they're in the news for all the wrong reasons. And, we, and we're not going to get into Owen Farrell. We spoke a lot about that. And the, the, the verdict is still, while we're recording this, is still uh, pending. But, uh, I mean, Billy Vinipola on the weekend uh, got, got a red card. They're having to answer all sorts of questions and not playing good rugby at the same time uh, about things that when you'd rather be asking, answering questions about your leading to the World Cup. Yes, I find it uh, quite stunning that England, uh, for the since they won the 2003 World Cup, um, have either gone into a World Cup or at the World Cup found ways of shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, but, I mean, 2007, uh, yeah. they were all over the place. They lost 36 zip to the box in a in a pool game. Uh, did very well to recover and get to the final. 2011, uh, they, they had all kinds of problems. Uh, there was the the dwarf dwarf tossing, there was the jumping of uh, bridges, there was uh, all kinds of things happened in that World Cup. They fell short, France knocked them out. 2015 at home, uh, there was the ignominy of not making it through to the next round. Um, and they didn't look that great until the latter stages of the, the last World Cup and did well to reach the final. And then, of yeah. course, then they fell well short. So it's, yeah, it, they do find ways of making it very difficult for themselves. But I mean, that's it's, thankfully, it's not something for us to to really worry about. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think it's one of those things where each each team's got their own problems. So we'll be uh, eagerly watching what happens there, and eagerly watching what Michael Checker does in that first week, because uh, that should be rather entertaining. And uh, yeah, so so uh, we're getting closer and closer, and uh, mm, we, it's it's exciting. yeah, it's get, the excitement level is going. Uh, some strange things happen, and we're going to leave you on this note. Um, uh, yesterday, uh, Dane Coles was asked, uh, of course, we heard the news that Sir Steve Hansen, Sir Steve Hansen, uh, went and helped out Eddie Jones's Wallabies, which, uh, you know, it might sound like nothing in professional rugby. Sorry to interrupt you, but is this the first time a Sir is called Shaq? <laughs> But anyway, uh, yeah, no, no, but yeah, in, in in normal rugby circles, any coach going to help another coach wouldn't be seen as anything, no matter where they're from. But in New Zealand, it's almost seen as a treason for him to do that. And uh, yeah, there was quite 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 an interesting reaction. Now, the, the the New Zealand media, when they spoke to Dane Coles, um, asked him if he knew about it, and it was the first, thing, and he gave this. I think the most honest reaction I've seen from a rugby player in a long time. So have a listen. What do you um, what do you make of your former coach linking up with the Wallabies? Who's that? Steve Hansen. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. he, has, he has to turn up to the game. A few days. He might yeah. not be paid. What are your thoughts? Yeah. What are you up to? <laughs> oh, that hurts a little bit. To be fair. Um, <laughs> Yeah, mate. Yeah, oh, I'm actually yeah, but speechless. Does it sting a little, given yeah, what he's brought to the All Blacks? Yeah, it, yeah, it does kind of bitter. Like, yeah, I love. He's a great man, and I suppose he can help out Eddie. Hopefully, he doesn't tell Eddie all our secrets. But I think he'll be respectful. You know, yeah, that's just me trying to process what you've just said. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it. It's a it's a huge week. That we'll chat to you next week after the All Black game. Well, I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about again. Maybe a few red cards. Maybe uh, a few interesting things. But uh, yeah, thanks for listening, Liam. It's been a good week. Uh, let's hope. Can you give a quick prediction on the All Black game? Oh, uh, I was hoping you'd spare me that. Um, I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna go with draw. I haven't actually thought of that, so I'm gonna sit on the fence on this one. I'm gonna go for a good old 22 all draw. Uh, look, I think I probably think the All Blacks might shade it from where they are at the moment, but um, I don't think it matters either way. I think both sides are good yeah. enough to bounce back and show their worth, so I don't think it really matters. They'll call it truce after 67 minutes with a score at 22. Uh, maybe not that way, but <laughs> but we're going to certainly have lots to talk about. That's it for today. Thanks, guys, for listening. Uh, we'll chat to you next week and uh, enjoy the game. 
Thanks for listening. And a reminder, you can find all the To The Last Drop podcasts on the Brendan Nell YouTube channel, iono.fm, Spotify, player.fm, Pocket Casts, Google Podcasts, and iTunes, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts.